Uh, welcome, everybody. This is uh, Kenny Miller again. Today, I'm going to talk about status asthmaticus in the adult patient uh, with acute severe asthma. Our learning objectives is we're going to review what is asthma, define what is status asthmaticus, acute severe asthma, describe some of the co conventional asthma treatments, uh, describe the utilization of ventilator graphics in the treatment and recognition of severe asthma, and then we'll talk about some rescue alternative therapies uh, utilized to manage severe asthma. So what is asthma? Asthma is a chronic inflammatory disease of the airways, uh, which causes the airways to be hyper-responsive and can cause increase in um, mucus secretion. There's always constant chronic airway inflammation and in patients that actually have an exacerbation or an asthma attack, you can actually get acute uh, inflammation on top of chronic airway inflammation. There's airway remodeling that occurs in these patients that can cause permanent airway changes and decrease the lumen of the airway. Uh, up to 10% of the United States are affected with asthma, which is a very, fairly robust population. And there's evidence that asthma has been increased in the last 60%. 10% of these asthmatics um, will require um, oral corticosteroid therapy, which is usually the standard of care for a exacerbation, or they'll have to go to the ED or hospital, or they'll have to be admitted to the hospital and sometimes to the ICU. Uh, the causes of acute exacerbations, there's many, many triggers of um, asthma. And again, this, this presentation is more on the severe asthmatics so we're in the management of them. So we're not going to go into all the different type of triggers, but respiratory infection, exposure to allergens, air pollutants, exposure to tobacco smoke, exercise, changes in weather, cold air exposure, uh, especially when you have the type of climate that we've had recently where you have 60 degree days and uh, two days later they're 20 and then two days later they're back up to 60 degrees. That can cause um, exacerbations. And often patients that have um, exacerbations or develop severe asthma are non-compliant with their medications. Now, when you look at the clinical presentation of asthma, there's both inspiratory and expiratory uh, wheezes uh, when there's diminished breath sounds or when there's uh, no air movement, that's an ominous side. Patients are tachypneic, they could be coughing, they're complaining of chest tightness, they have increased secretions, uh, increase in muscle, especially muscle use because the lumens are reduced and there's an increase in amount of resistance. And the patients will be very anxious. Sometimes they're diaphoretic, uh, sometimes they're grabbing for their sheets, um, and that because the sensation of dyspnea and severe dyspnea is very anxiety provoking. Uh, so what's different in acute severe asthma compared to a, quote, a generic asthma attack? Well, the, these patients don't respond to uh, initial bronchodilator treatment. You know, many times they use their inhalers over and over and over with very little release, relief, and they can actually develop tremor, tachycardia, and actually uh, taxiphylaxis where the actual medication becomes bronchoconstricted. They're, they're tachypneic. They have significant accessory muscle use retractions. They're often confused and fatigued because they're exhausted. Uh, they may have minimal breath sounds. Uh, if you looked at their PF, you know, pulmonary uh, function studies or peak expiratory flow, it's very low. It's always less than 50%. And there is some evidence that doing a uh, peak flow measurement when a patient's having an asthma attack can actually cause air trap and, and cause an increase in severity. They become uh, hypercapnic. They end up becoming hypoxic. They're not oxygen uh, re reactive. And if you don't really intervene in a timely manner, they just can progress to respiratory failure and thus cardiac arrest. You know, hypercarbia in these type of patients is another ominous sign that uh, ominous sign is that um, typically a ABG 
on an asthmatic patient shows a res respiratory alkalemia. If there starts becoming a respiratory acidemia, these patients need to be uh, basically intubated, put on mechanical ventilation because their compensatory mechanisms have failed and now they're you know, heading to total exhaustion. So this is a you know, picture of a patient that is in severe distress. They're using a lot of accessory muscles. They're, um, uh, again, um, you know, really having a lot of work of breathing. They're very anxious. You can see the fear in the face. You can see the grasp in their sheets uh, at this point. So you got to make different diagnoses, too, because patients can come in looking very similar to the picture that we just painted. But they could, you know, you have to differentiate between COPD exacerbations, patients in pulmonary edema, pneumonia, obviously going through COVID, you know, <clears throat> what those patients look like. Pulmonary emboli, uh, pneumothorax may it be, you know, uh, nitrogenically induced or spontaneous, or an allergic response like anaphylaxis from a bee sting, et cetera. And in severe asthma, you have this um, pathway, what I like to call is, you know, the pathway of doom where you have bronchospasm, airway inflation, and, and inflammation, you have increased and secretions mucus plug in. Often these type of patients have a lot of thick viscous um, mucus, which then causes uh, lung hyperinflation, you can't get air out, you can't get air in, CO2 starts being retained, and you have a ventilation perfusion mismatch where you now develop in hypoxemia that initially will be response to the oxygen, but once we start getting into a diffusion de deficit or a shunt, you can now get refractory oxygen um, response. And, it, it, and we'll talk about this a little bit more. It can occur over days or can occur over hours, depending upon the etiology and the patient uh, demographics. So here's a good picture of um, an x-ray, is you have a patient that has hyperinflation, you have the flattened diaphragms um, on the AP, and then the lateral, you can see the flattened diaphragm. Um, there are inherent risk factors uh, for deaths from asthmatics, uh, asthmatics who've had a history of severe exacerbations, uh, two or more related hospitalizations in a year, uh, more than three ED visits for asthma. So you can see this is patients that have uncontrolled asthma and they have, um, you know, what they call uh, refractory or severe asthma in the sense that uh, these patients would be candidates for maybe biological therapies, thermoplasty, because even um, despite, you know, utilizing a lot of conventional medications, they don't have their asthma under control, which then increases a chance for death. Uh, these patients use their inhaler and their rescue inhalers quite frequently. Uh, often, unfortunately, social economic um, class plays a role in this because these individuals either are not educated well in the sense about the disease and they don't have the uh, financial ability to get the medications in order to control their asthma. And then you could have illegal drug use that could be a trigger and you could have medic medical or psychiatric comorbidities, patients that are obese, patients that have other type of respiratory uh, sequela or patients who, again, don't understand the severity of the disease or understand how to use their medications appropriately or are um, totally resistant to use their medications because of a preconceived stigma. In teenagers, for example, um, the use of inhalers shows a sign of weakness and a lot of often teenagers will not want to take their asthma medication because they want, don't want to be seen as, as weak or you know, not normal. So the standard treatments for a lot of these different um, asthma attacks is, you know, uh, nebulized bronchodilators, you can get beta agonists, your Prevental, your um, uh, Zopinex, or you can give your muscocarian uh, antagonists like Atrovan and you put them together and make dual neb, uh, systemic corticosteroids, steroids, 
um, you know, prednisone, you can give um, IV steroids, a lot of high hydration because these patients are trachyptic. They're going to become dry. Oxygen therapy, heliox, and at the end, if necessary, mechanical ventilation. So the goals of mechanical ventilation is to really use um, low rates, uh, long expiratory times, and keep an airway pressure as well. The idea is that you don't want to, you know, you don't want to increase the chance of um, air trapping or barotrauma pneumothoraxes. So again, you you know you you want to give you know these patients you can give eight to ten cc's per kilo because you don't worry about you know volume trauma per se. But you got to keep that rate down low in order to give them enough expiratory time so they don't end up having air trapping. And often these patients do require sedation or may even need a paralytic administered in order to get ventilators synchronized because patients that are short of breath will not breathe slow and deep. Even though it is the best physiological way to breathe, it's not the most comfortable way to breathe or almost possible way to breathe in these different high resistance type of and high obstructive type of uh, physiological patterns. So when you look at uh, again, you know, gas distribution in the alveoli, you can see gas can come in um, at the end of exhalation, you have gas trapped, and then the next positive pressure breath comes in, and you really can't even get ventilation in because you have this mucus plug in, and you have these obstructed airways, so the gas can come in to improve gas exchange, and the gas can't come out in order to get rid of CO2. And when you look at auto peak measurements, which are the classic way of determining in how much air trapping is going on, the problem with it is in order to do it correctly and get the correct, you know, really, the, the, you know, a correct picture of how severe the air trapping is, you end up having to really do these maneuvers for long periods of time. Because I have different alveoli here, and you can see this one's really plugged up. The auto peep of this one's almost 30, where this one's open, you know, it's only partially blocked, and the auto peeps of five. So if you want to really get an idea of how much auto peep there is, you need to be able to hold exhalation long enough so this one will empty quick. This one will be the next one empty out. This will be the next one. But to get this idea of what the auto peep is, you're going to have to hold this maneuver almost up to 10 seconds, which can, again can cause you know a plethora of problems also. But again, I, I sometimes auto peep measurements and auto peep numbers do not really reflect totally the the, the true severity of auto peep in, um, at the point. So just keep that in mind. Again, you know they. There's some advantages. They can trend values. They give you an estimate of airway, and they're easily um, uh, performed. But sometimes they can underestimate the severity. They can lead to more air trapping. Uh, some of the ventilators have limitations on how they uh, record the data, and the data can be re uh, interpreted incorrectly. So you know, again, auto peak measurements are very helpful. And I'm not sure I'm trying to say that you know don't do them, but understand there are limitations and there are some disadvantages to them. Now there's there's again a lot of other potential complications that are not associated necessarily with the asthma attack, but because you have this air trap and, and you have you know a heterogeneous lung where maybe some some alveoli are not quite as obstructed as others, you could have an increased chance of pneumothorax, pneumomyostinum, again, mucus plug-in, especially because you have hypersecretions plus the patient's tachypnic, the patient is dry because they're breathing fast, and um, so you could have severe, severe mucus plug-in. You could have cardiac stress, cardiomyopathy, if in the sense that the patient is very, very cardiac stressed, um, and they're working hard, and patients that have underlying uh, cardiac disease could get ischemic and then thus get uh, some, you know, uh, ventricular uh, irregularities, and then you could actually get patients that go into dysarrhythmias and some that could be lethal. Uh, you know, hypotension, especially if you get a pulses paradoxus, where the hyperinflation can actually decrease venous return because the pleural pressure is so high and is transmitted to the great vessels. 
uh, you can get lactic acidosis, a production of lactic from the uh, accessory muscles being used. Um, there's a lot of anaerobic respiration going on, and there's not a lot of ATP being produced. So there's a lot of lactic acid as an end product. And, there, and the high doses of albutrol can cause uh, lactic acidosis also. And then patients can get anoxic from cerebral anoxia and you know, that's really a very common death in asthmatic patients that they suffer a irreversible neurological injury if they're, led, if they're, you know, progressed to a point where they no longer are, you know, breathing appropriately and thus they become hypercarbic uh, and they end up getting all that cerebral edema and they become hypoxic and they get anoxic from those events. So you got air trap and increased pulmonary vascular resistance, a decrease in venous return, which decreases cardiac output and causes hemodynamic instability. So patients that have status asthmaticus and they also progress to um, cardiac dysfunction and decompensation obviously need to be admitted to the ICU. And again, you gotta be careful with positive pressure breathing because positive pressure breathing will exacerbate this air trapping if not done correctly, and even if done correctly, uh, and cause a increased amount of um, more air trapping, which will increase the amount of portal pressure, which will decrease venous return, et cetera, even worse. You gotta be very, very careful. So here's a pulse of paradoxus and it shows that um, the blood pressure varies more than 10 milligrams between inspiration and exhalation, and it's very reflective of obstruction and air trap. And so that's a, again, another uh, ominous sign in, in status asthmatic is when the patient develops a pulse paradoxus. I don't care what the auto peep says on the, on the ventilator or what you might see on the x-ray, it's definitely that the patient has a tremendous amount of auto peep. And, and if not corrected soon, patient won't die of respiratory decompensation, they'll have a hemodynamic event that will lead to their demise. So in life threat and asthma, okay, and here's patient on a ventilator with asthma. You know, it's, it, it's really a classification, as, it, as I said earlier in that one slide, it can be gradual deterioration over an extended period of time, and that's usually associated with infection, or it could be a mild, attack that turns into severe attack, attack that's often called asphyxia asthma. These are the patients that often unfortunately die at home on the way to the hospital or in the emergency room. It can often be associated with a certain event or a reaction, you know, maybe um, somebody who who was involved, you know, who was exposed to an overabundance amount of triggers. So somebody who might be in a dust storm okay, and, and get all that dust inhaled. You know, maybe somebody working at a construction site gets all that dust inhaled, or somebody is in grief stricken and they are emotionally stressed and then go into the asthma attack. And the thing about this, it can occur with any asthmatic. So any asthmatic, even though they're very stable, any time can turn into a life-threatening event because remember, asthma, even when the patient's asymptomatic, they have asthma. It's no different when a person has cardiac disease. Even if they don't have chest pain, they still have cardiac disease. So I think that's very, very important to understand. And, you know, when you're educating your asthmatic patients to really, really stress that I know you're feeling good, but you still have asthma and you got to take your medications. So when you look at, you know, the definition of asthma, you have a mild to moderate, which usually the patient oxygenates well, Okay, they're not, you know, they're not real to keep, they're not using muscles. They can talk in full sentences and they may have wheezing that you can hear with a stethoscope. So that's mild to moderate. When you start getting this severe, you start getting signs of now hypoxemia. The, uh, if they can do a peak flow, it's pretty low. It's less than 50%. They start becoming tachypneic. I mean, obviously if they're over the, you know, under the age of five, they will be more tachypneic. Uh, they're very short of breath to either feed or talk. Um, they can talk in full senses. Now they start becoming tachycardia. There's evidence of you know, accessory muscle and they have audible wheezes. So here you need to intervene because you don't want to get to the next level, which is life threatening. The SAT's less than 92, so they're, they're hypoxic. Now, if you can measure a peak flow, and I would not recommend doing a peak flow at this point, obviously you know it's low. You don't need a number to, to, to that. 
Uh, they may not be able to create a pig flow. They have a slight, slight in chest. As I've always said, a wheeze is better than no wheeze. They have poor respiratory effort. They're confused, tired, falling asleep. Um, they're agitated because these are hypoxic, they're hypercarbic and exhausted. And they can be cyanide. That is a very bad sign because typically, again, asthma is not a alveolar capillary disease. Hypoxia is not a hallmark of asthma. But in this case, there's either so much mucus plug-in or such poor ventilation that there's no oxygen getting to the hemoglobin and thus get to the tissue. So this is, you know, you, this you got to, like, here's a chance to intervene and get under control. Here's a chance you better get under control. Now at this point you've lost control and you're going to have to do rescue measures. Again, you know, look at the gradual course. Um, it's over days. The incident is 33%. Using mucus plug-in is the big problem. The inflammatory is more incinophilic, okay, allergic type of asthma type of thing. Slow to response to treatment. The hospitalization can be long. And prevention, it's, it, it's possible uh, in the sense that if the patient would have been on biologicals or maybe used their medications better, uh, it could have been possible. Maybe avoid the trigger. Sudden onset, there's, you know, it could be hours, it could be a fixed six, as I just said. Uh, there is a high incidence of those of severe asthma. They don't really have airway um, mucus plug-in because it's too quick. Neutrophilic is the inflammatory cell. Now, as bad as they are, as quick as it comes, it can also go away in the sense because the duration of this is shorter. So these patients can turn around a little bit quicker. Uh, prevention, again, underdetermined because a lot of times we don't even know what caused these sudden onsets. Where here you kind of have a, you know, you kind of have a picture that's kind of painted in front of you. This is just kind of a quick snapshot. So again, you know, when you look at hospitalization, um, you, you know, group, you know, again, when you're thinking about should a patient be admitted to the hospital, duration of severity of symptoms, the severity of airflow, the severity of prior exacerbations, um, medical utilization at the time of exacerbation, have they been kind of using an inhaler nonstop? You know, how many times have they had similar type of events? You know, how obstructive is their airways? You know, access to medical care and medications is important. If you're going to discharge a patient, they got to be able to, one, do their treatments, and two, be able to get medicines. And then present of psychological illnesses, and home support and conditions. Again, you don't want to discharge someone to a, squ a squalor environment where it's full of all kinds of triggers and the patient's just going to end up either again coming back or this time coming back even worse. Now, when you look at high ICU admission, uh, if they're drowsy or confused, again, hypoxia, CO2 retention, there's evidence of paradoxical breathing. That means the diaphragm and other muscles or respiratory muscles are exhausted. There's no um, sound, breath sounds moving. Bradycardia, again, tachycardia is a compensatory mechanism. Once you get bradycardia, you know, your compensatory hemodynamic, um, you know, um, hemodynamic uh, compensation has now been exhausted. Uh, again, these peak flows, I, I wouldn't be doing peak flows on patients that are this severe. It's uh, evident, uh, evident, you don't have to say whether peak flow is less than 25, let's take them to the ICU. There's enough other signs that I think would lead you to believe that the patient needs ICU management. They're hypoxic despite being on oxygen, and they have signs of pulse paradoxes, which means they have a significant amount of air trapping. So again, this is, you know, we showed this guy before. Uh, these, you know, when they look like this, they definitely need to be admitted and you have to think about possibly ICU admission. And you have these flattened diaphragms at this point. So when you see these things and they're all kind of accumulated into a, um, into a pattern, into a, you know, picture for you, you start realizing what patients should probably not go home what patients should, might be able to go to the med surge unit, what patients need to go to the ICU. And here's a 22-year-old status asthmaticus that we had um, admitted, and you can see um, how hyperinflated the lungs are, and the pleural pressure is so high that the heart 
is actually tamponaded between both lungs because of the increased amount of air trap and the heart is the size of a freaking pear in this patient. So you can see that the air trapping has significantly reduced cardiac output and cardiac function. Now, this is a nice algorithm from one of the emergency centers, um, a Vanderbilt Emergency Center, that looks at the treatment of life threat asthma. And it looks at like the initial assessment, obviously looking at uh, patients, listen to breath sounds, look at the patient's work of breathing, um, other, you know, heart rate, respiratory rate, doing a peak flow if possible, looking at the SPO2, and then, you know, chest x-rays, things like that. And then based on the peak flows, um, then they go. Now, there's impending respiratory rest. Obviously, you're going to use 100% oxygen. And then you can just follow this through and, and you make the definition. Is this a moderate exacerbation or is this severe exacerbation? And then you do interventions. And if you have a poor response, they're going to go to the ICU. An incomplete response, they're, they're going to go to the hospital ward, as they call here. And a good response, you can consider about uh, discharging them uh, after 60 minutes after last treatment to see if it's if the response is, is is prolonged. So this is a nice algorithmic approach that looks at how we need to think about managing asthmatic patients when they come in through the uh, uh, emergency room. And then again, when patients are discharged, you know they're given instructions on what medications to use, and then patient education and then also follow-up measurements need to happen. Because again, even if a patient might be here, but they don't have the ability to, um, you know, do these things, you know, take medicine, you know, get, get access to medications or be able to do them right, or they're going into a home environment that's unsafe, then you can't discharge them home. You have to admit them until these things can be, um, you know, modified or cleaned up. Now, utilizing ventilator graphics, I think, is, again, very, very helpful on, you know, these patients when they are intubated. Uh, you can look at your flow time curves. You can look at your pressure volume curves and, you know, your peak airway pressure and plateau gradients. Your typical peak airway pressure plateau gradient is pretty narrow. It's usually less than 10 centimeters. In patients with asthma, it could be extremely high. It could be as much as 20, 25% different from the peak airway versus the plateau because of their high resistance, all right? But um, again, you, you look at this point, you can see the bird, bird's beak cause over distension. So you don't want to ventilate up in that area. And then maybe do pre and post you know, um, compliance changes and resistance changes as you, you know, administer medications or you do things like Heliox we'll talk about. One of the hallmarks is use continuous um, albutrol therapy. It's usually 10 to 25 milligrams per hour or 0.15 to 1 milligram per kilo per hour. So some are weight based, some are volume based at this point. But you want to pump always used when you're going to do that with a vibrant mesh. So you want to make sure the patient is always adequately getting the medication, again, the appropriate dose of the medication. Uh, sometimes he's clogged up, so you got to be very careful that um, the medication is actually getting to the patient. The side effects of continuous albuterol is going to be tachycardia, hyperkalemia, taxiphylaxis, and tremor. Now, it's interesting, patients could have tremor and we don't see it if they end up being on a paralytic uh, at this point. So keep that in mind that if the patient's paralyzed, you may not be able to see some of the side effects that occur uh, from continuous albutrol uh, therapy. Now, alternative therapies include things like permissive hypercarbia, allowing their pH, but you can't do that in certain patient populations. Uh, there are some limited trials that have said that high flow oxygen and not, um, you know, BiPAP is limited trials. Uh, magnesium sulfate, you can use theophylline, uh, aminophylline IV, uh, BV ECMO, and uh, serofluorophane therapy, which is a gas that helps re, re, um, re, um, relax smooth muscles, is usually done in the operating theater. 
um, you know, again, you know, this is, you know, again, Heliox is, is also part of this. So in permissive um, hypercarbia, we usually keep the pH above 7.25. Don't worry too much about the CO2. Buffer with FAM or bicarb. You got to be careful because bicarb will produce CO2. So you got to be careful that you don't get the patient more acidotic, even if you're given a buffer. May, may cause cardiac ischemia in patients that have myocardial disease, and it can't be used with head injuries, hindered patients. Um, you know, if the asthmatic had an attack and hit their head and had an increased intracranial bleed, um, you couldn't do your strategy because that would cause intracranial swelling. Heliox is a nice alternative that to just oxygen and air in the sense that it produces a lower Reynolds number. You have to go back in your head about Reynolds numbers, but the lower the number, Reynolds number, the less turbulent is the flow of gas. And studies have shown that uh, it can decrease the work of breathing by 35%. It does decrease uh, paradox, uh, pa pulses paradoxes. It helps reduce CO2. Now, historically, it was unreliable to use it with ventilator monitoring because you had to do con conversion factors. But there are ventilators today that have heliox blocks that you can actually uh, just hook the one, the airline into a uh, heliox cylinder and your ventilator will record accurate data. And it shows here, if we look at these graph here, pressure on the X, volume on the Y, and you look at airway obstruction, you can see the patient had a very, very resistive lung prior to just you know using oxygen air. As they increased heliox, now here's a 60-40 mix, it did help a little bit, but really once you get down to 80-20, which is anything less than 60 is considered very therapeutic, you can see you can reduce this tremendously. So that resistance was reduced um, quite significant by just using heliox versus oxygen and air. And patients that do get you spontaneously, uh, you can give heliox via mask. Uh, they will tell you even though you don't see a change in the peak flow that dynamically. Their shortness of breath, their Borg, their Borg score, which is the intensity of dyspnea, will go down tremendously. Even though maybe their pulmonary function numbers don't change dramatically, they will tell you their work of breathing will change, which is very, very important because it will decrease their respiratory rate, which will decrease the chance of air traffic, decrease their heart rate, which decreases the chance of cardiac ischemia, and they'll be less anxious, and which is, you know, very, very important. So again, you know, uh, Heliox reduces resistance. We can see that on the ventilator. We can see that on reduced resistance. Uh, measurements, but we can also, the patient themselves will tell us they feel more comfortable. And again, this is, this is pre-heliox. Um, the resistance is 86, and we have quite a high airway pressure uh, with a peak airway pressure of 48. Uh, we get, you know, here's, you're getting 48, here's our tidal volume. And we give them heliox and the resistance drops from 70, uh, from 78 to 29. We're able to decrease our driving pressure and still maintain our tidal volume. So this was a 70-30 administration. Now the problem with this is, with heliox is that the patient's hypoxemic and requires a lot of oxygen. Heliox becomes off the table and you cannot, um, you cannot administer it because the patient needs more oxygen and the patient will become hypoxic. So you want to try to get heliox on patients early in the um, in the hospital course because once they develop mucus plug-in, they will end up um, requiring much more oxygen because they'll have a ventilation perfusion mismatch along with airway obstruction. VV ECMO is utilized in severe situations often associated with mucus plug-in. Um, airway pressure is greater than 35. CO2s that are very high with acid, you know, respiratory acidemia. FIO2 requirements around 60%. And the idea with BB ECMO is we're going to allow the lung to reset and rest until um, the bronchodilator steroids and all the other type of interventions can reverse the bronchospasm and inflammation. For those that aren't familiar with this, you can see that 
um, with an ECMO catheter. This is a Avalon catheter. It's a single lumen. It's a single catheter with multiple lumens, and it basically drains out venous blood, goes to an oxygenator, which it's oxygenated, and then there's flow meter, which bl flows off or blows off CO2, and then enriched oxygen comes back to the tricuspid valve where the heart pumps it out. Again, with VV ECMO, you want to make sure that the patient has pretty good cardiac function, because if they don't have good cardiac function, then they need VA ECMO, which is a whole different uh, way of administered ECMO. But in, usually for asthmatics, VV ECMO is, is what's usually indicated. And here's a picture of an ECMO catheter in the patient. Here was patient has asthma. So it allows the sweep to remove CO2s, allows for oxygenation. And again, you know, these patients that are hypoxic and have asthma, now because you're using the oxygenator from ECMO, you can allow uh, heliox to be administered in these patients and not worry about the FL2. So you can put your ventilator down to 21% and give basically 80% of heliox. And you don't have to worry about oxygenation because that occurs with the oxygenator on the ECMO device. And it minimizes ventilator-induced injury because you don't have to worry about CO2 removal because the sweep's going to take care of that for you. Um, it's associated with many hazards. Uh, I'm not going to say ECMO is a panacea. It has a plethora of problems. Typical asthmatics require three to five days, and they're usually a quick ECMO and ventilator wean. So once they're decannulated, they often come off the ventilator right afterwards. This is not what we see in you know, other types of ECMO use with ARDS, et cetera. Uh, we, you know, we did a study on this, looking at the use of VV ECMO for status asthmatic. Um, again, you know, I he emphasizes requires intubation, mechanical ventilation. They often have high CO2s, require high minute ventilation. And, um, you know, you can't really do lung protection or heliox. Ventilator reduce is common, and the mortality rate of refractory asthma is about 8%. So the good news is that most asthmatics don't die that have severe, severe asthma. But again, 8% of, you know, 10% of 10% of, you know, 300 million people in this country, that still adds up to a fair amount of people. You know, they say every day one asthmatic dies, um, you know, unfortunately. So again, you know, we just talks about, at, you know, why we use ECMO. So I just want to put this in here just to, you know, give you an idea that it's not just something that's theoretical. It's something that we've used in our practice. And, you know, again, you know, this is very important at the bottom here is allows for other clinical interventions to be administered in a more systematic, time-friendly manner. You're not in much a rescue mode once you have stability of gases with the ECMO machine. So we looked at a two-year time frame where we had put six status asthmaticus on ECMO. Um, five out of six ended up doing very well. Unfortunately, we had one patient who developed multi-system organ failure unrelated to asthma and ended up dying. So again, some of these patients are very, very sick. They don't, you know, you know they have, they develop asthma, but they have a significant uh, comorbidities also. And again, you know, we, you know, we do things like making sure we optimize the PEEP to use PEEP to help stent the airways, to help improve expiratory flow. Um, the way you figure out the correct PEEP is using transpulmonary monitoring along with PV tool. But really, if your plateau pressure remains stable or drops as you add the PEEP, it's a nice way of determining that you have alveolar unloaded and you're not adding to the uh, actual auto PEEP in. And there's a picture of an ECMO device. And this was our patient population group. You know, everybody got continuous uh, prevental. Everybody had esophageal balloons in. The PEEP range was 10 to 16. Again, not for oxygenation, but for airway stentin. And patients four and five developed bare trauma prior to cannulation, which meant they had pneumothoraxes uh, prior. And as I said, the one, the one patient uh, ended up unfortunately uh, pass it. But you can see the settings we used, um, how long they were on uh, ECMO, their ECMO settings, and then once they were decannulated, how long it was until they got extubated. And all the group received um, heliox and all the groups were paralyzed.
we seen also continuous paralytic at least for the first 72 hours. Uh, again, this is Heliox again showing a before and after picture. Now, one of these things too is uh, I've not myself used this, uh, but I've heard about it. It's a um, fluorine being used, a general anesthetic. It has a rapid onset and it has a, uh, it's a liquid vaporized for inhalation. It clears primarily pulmonary exhalation. It's a very potent uh, bronca dilator and it can be used very effectively in patients that have asthma. So there's, you know, these are the advantages. Um, it's a bronchodire effect. It can provide sedation without some of the side effects of other devices. Um, it, it can be cleared relatively quick. And it says it's um, decreased time to extubation. Disadvantages, it needs specialized equipment. It's off-label in the ICU. It can cause malignant hypothermia, cause increased interpress intracranial pressures in patients that have neurological issues. And um, <clears throat> the minimal tidal volume when you're using this is 350. So some of these tidal volumes need to be rather high, which can cause volume trauma and other type of uh, uh, problems. So again, you know, with, with, with the patients that have um, severe asthma, it's very, very important that, you know, we as respiratory therapists, you know, make sure we assess the patient correctly, recognize the severity of the asthma, be familiar with the different arsenal of weaponry and treatments that are available. Always anticipate the next steps, as I showed you that picture before. As the patient became, went from mild to severe, if you don't intervene at these times, at that time, you are going to run into big time problems, all right? So you, you have a window of opportunity. And if you don't necessarily get through that opportunity, you're gonna run into real problems because once they become severe, now you're in crisis mode and you're in rescue mode and you don't really wanna stay there. Um, be an advocate for your patient. Make sure that these patients, if they get to this point and once they recover, that you make sure that they have a great asthma action plan. They have, they're going home to an environment that can nurture, you know, asthma help and asthma control. Not that they're going into an environment where, you know, there's three or four people smoking cigarettes. There's all kind of danders. There's cockroaches. There's all kind of triggers that are just going to cause this very vicious circle to be, you know, reproduced time after time. Uh, make sure you don't do anything about the ventilator. You know, with these patients, sometimes the less is better. So again, we don't really have to worry about, you know, ventilating these patients. They don't have, you know, using high minute ventilation. Again, they don't have alveolar problems. We have to be able to allow time for air to get out so air can get in. So lower volumes, lower rates, you know, try to minimize pressure, use PEEP, you know, judiciously look at your peak airway pressures, look at your plateau pressures. Again, if I add PEEP and the compliance gets worse, and that's a bad thing, I'm, I'm over distending the lung. But if I add PEEP and it improves the compliance, it improves, you know, reduces the plateau pressure, and you look at x ray and the lungs look like they're deflating better, your tidal volumes are increasing if you're on a pressure target, these are all positive you know, add positive evidence that the PEEP is helping stent in the airway. You know, as I said, you know, in our ECMO group of patients, they all needed a fair amount of PEEP because of the severity of their air trapping. You know, the more air trapping, the probably the more PEEP they're going to require at this point. Um, you know, again, lung protective, avoid bare trauma, we said that. Monitor closely the patient. You can use your ventilator graphics. There, you know, these ventilators today have tons and tons of information. You should trend in the information, put up the appropriate trend in parameters to see how you're benefiting. You know, what's happening after you're given a continuous treatment? Is the resistance going to down, round, down? You know, what, what's happening to, you know, again, the airway pressures, et cetera. Look at your x-rays, look at your capographs. You have a whole gamut of ininvasive type of monitor that can help direct you and figure out the patient's progressing or deteriorating at this point.
and become an asthma act expert. I, I really think that, you know, it's very, very important as respiratory therapists to understand, you know, what is asthma? What are the, you know, physiological abnormalities of asthma? You know, what are the conventional therapies? And then in these cases, what are rescue therapies? That's why an arsenal of interventional ideas and technology can be life-saving in this, in this group of patients. So summary, uh, asthma can be life-threatening, uh, recognize and status asthmatic, acute severe asthma is very important. And again, have an arsenal of non-conventional asthma interventions for the severe asthmatic. So, you know, at, at this point, you know, if you have questions, you can always contact me and we can address them. We have a list of references that are here that again um, are available to review additional information.